Hello, this is Joe Trahan welcoming you to the All Me Podcast from the Taylor Hooten Foundation, whose mission is to enlighten the world to the truths about appearance and performance-enhancing substances. As the national leader on this subject, they communicate their educational messages through various methods, including this podcast. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Hi, and welcome to the All Me Podcast. My name is Tavis Piatoli, sports dietitian for the Taylor Hooten Foundation, and today I'm going to be your host. Whether it's the sudden onset after an intense bout of exercise or that middle of the night wake up call, a muscle cramp can be incredibly painful. Many individuals from high performance athletes to everyday individuals suffer from muscle cramps. What are the driving factors causing these cramps? In this podcast, we speak with Dr. Kevin Miller to discuss the potential factors that are causing muscle cramps whether or not dehydration has any direct impact on playing a role in cramping, the best ways to attend and treat someone with cramp, the role of stress on cramping, and do electrolytes help. Stick around to the end to learn more about specific myths on the role of creatine, bananas, and pickle juice on treating cramps. Dr. Kevin Miller is a professor in the athletic training program at Texas State University. His research interests include the causes, treatments, and prevention of exertional heat illness with a specific emphasis on exercise associated muscle cramping and exertional heat stroke in American football players. He has published over 65 peer reviewed manuscripts in medical journals and presented over 100 international, national and regional presentations on topics related to heat illness. He's also co-authored several national and international position statements, including the 2015 NATA position statement on exertional heat illness the statement of the third international exercise associated hyponatremia consensus development conference, the 2021 NETA roundtable on the pre-hospital care of patients with exertional heat stroke. He serves as an associate editor for the Journal of Athletic Training and is a member of the Corey Stringer Institute's Medical and Science Advisory Board and the NATA's Convention Program Committee. Dr. Miller, it's so good to have you today on the All Me podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us and share your expertise. My pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. So this is a really exciting topic, um, really the misconceptions of cramping. We're going to dive into cramping. I know a lot of people have asked us, and me as a sports dietitian, what's the what's the really main reason people cramp? And I've heard so much stuff, and you're going to help us to answer a lot of that. But before we really dive into today's topic, the first thing I want to learn about for our listeners is just tell us about your career path. Why did you get into the field of athletic training? Sure. So uh, like a lot of undergraduate students, I entered college thinking I was going to go into medicine. And after my first year, realized what a time commitment and life commitment medicine was. And so realized I didn't want to be in school for 10 years or more. So I had a rethink in my sophomore year about the career path I wanted to go down. And I'd always loved sports and I knew I wanted to do something with medicine and healthcare. And so I just really combined the terms and like sports medicine, that's got to be a thing, right? (laughs) And so did some investigation into uh, what athletic training was and met with our head athletic trainer at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay, and really fell in love with the profession after that. And over the course of my undergraduate career and falling in love with collegiate athletics, I decided I wanted to get my master's degree so I could work uh, division one athletics because I love the the high fast pace division one collegiate atmosphere and in the course of completing my master's degree at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse I was forced to do a research project and fell in love with research and as I fell in love with research I decided to pursue my PhD and wasn't in school for 10 years but it took me about nine so funny how <laughs> life turns out that way but Uh, Now I get to do uh, what I love every day, which is try and help people um, prevent and diagnose and treat exercise associated heat illnesses. So that leads kind of to my next question. Most athletic trainers, they get into their profession, they become licensed, certified, they work for a team, you know, do their, their treatment work. And then you chose, you wanted to do that, but then you chose a different route and getting into the research side. And then you really seem to have a lot of interest in the cramping side. What what made you discover that interest in studying what impacts muscle cramping? Yeah, for me, I can trace it back to an exercise physiology class I had as an undergraduate student where we were l- learning about fluid and electrolyte balance and 
my exercise physiology professor at the time made a quick comment saying, well, you know, I don't know why athletic trainers believe that cramping is due to electrolyte loss because when you exercise and you sweat, the concentration of your electrolytes increases in your bloodstream. It doesn't decrease. And I sat back and I thought about his comment. I'm like, holy cow, you're actually right. And so the kind of fun studying exercise associated muscle cramping is that there are so many myths and misconceptions and there's a lot of room for growth in this area. And so some of those kind of uh, idiosyncrasies in the, the literature and kind of you know, conflicting pathological arguments were really interesting to me. And then just from a personal perspective, I had really struggled with my own muscle cramping during exercise. I played soccer for my entire adolescent life and pretty competitively. And I remember just a lot of tournaments where my calves or quads and hamstrings would just completely freeze up. And I knew that, you know, muscle cramps were imminent for me. And so from a personal perspective, I was vested in trying to figure out why these things occur and therefore trying to help people so that they can live better and have more productive athletic careers. Excellent. So let's dive into the topic a little bit. Let's kind of talk about, well, first of all, let's define what a muscle cramp actually is. So is there like a definition for muscle cramp? Right. And that's, this is where a lot of the, I think, myths and misconceptions come from is there's a lot of disorders and diseases that afflict the muscular system. And so anytime you talk about something, especially when you try to talk about the pathophysiology of it, you really have to be careful about what you're talking about. You have to have a really clear definition of what you're trying to talk about. And so when we talk about muscle cramping, because there are so many different conditions that involve the muscles, things like tics, twitches, fasciculations, contractures, you know, and then of course the term cramps themselves are seemingly used a lot of times in the same way, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So uh, people use these terms incorrectly and interchangeably with each other all the time. And so that, that leads itself to a lot of confusion, but those terms like a contracture or a tremor or a tick or a spasm, they have very specific scientific definitions. And so when we talk about cramping in this podcast, or if I refer to a muscle cramp, what I'm talking about is a involuntary, painful contraction of a skeletal muscle that occurs before, during, or after exercise. And the only thing that seems to be affecting the athlete in a negative way are these muscle cramps. And so again, very important that we define what we're talking about because we know muscle cramping can be a symptom of underlying disease like diabetes or hypothyroidism. And it can also be a result of some kind of general medical condition or even treatment like dialysis. We know that a lot of folks that undergo dialysis get muscle cramping as well. And so uh, very specifically, the cramps that we're talking about right now are those that occur during exercise and they only happen to people that are healthy. There's no underlying medication use. There's no underlying medical condition. And uh, the only thing, again, that seems wrong with the person is they get these muscle cramps. When we look at causes, I'm sure I've heard so many different things, right? But let's, let's kind of look and see, is there a primary cause when an athlete or individual experiences a muscle cramp or, or are there multiple factors that can play a role here? Right. This is kind of the, the golden question in, in my area of research. And so I would say for the last hundred years or so, or between 1900 and really about 1997, the world was under the impression that muscle cramping during exercise or during physical work was the result of dehydration or electrolyte imbalance. And then right around 1997, uh, folks like Dr. Martin Schwellness out of Cape Town, South Africa came around and started questioning some of the things that we thought we knew about muscle cramping and started relating them back to more changes in the neurological system. And Martin suggested that cramping during exercise was more the result of changes due to fatigue. And then just very recently in 2022, I proposed a new theory, which I very creatively called the multifactorial theory, which rather than proposing a singular cause, like cramping is due to dehydration by itself or cramping is due to just fatigue, uh, we propose that cramping could be due to any number of recipes and that it's not really a singular cause, but rather 
it's the combination of several different um, either intrinsic or extrinsic risk factors that when combined under the right settings create changes in the nervous system and therefore elicit muscle cramping. And so just like there are a hundred different spaghetti sauces out there, there might be a hundred different ways for someone to get an exercise associated muscle cramp. So it's not, it's, it's, it's like, like, as you mentioned, it's a variety of different things. And yeah, that kind of leads into my, my next question about exercise, right? Because we're talking about exercise induced muscle cramps. How does the intensity play a role? Because can the intensity and type of exercise someone perform initiate a cramp? Yeah, I believe quite significantly. And so we know a lot of folks that uh, get muscle cramping, they kind of have this sense that if they do an activity, they're going to get a muscle cramp, right? Even some folks uh, can generate muscle cramps on command. I know like if I point my toes down hard enough, I can probably cramp my calf just sitting here and there hasn't been any dehydration. There's no electrolyte imbalance. And yet I can create a muscle cramp with forceful, high intensity contraction that's prolonged. And so when you look at uh, what's going on during exercise, if someone is unaccustomed to a certain exercise intensity or an exercise duration, then I think they're going to predispose themselves to possible cramping. Well, and, and I so, noticed that when I'm lying down in bed, I've just moved my, my hamstring or leg the right way. I'm like, oh, I'm feeling something like full. I'm like, that's not a, not a good feeling at all. And that might not be, it seems like it's a cramp, but it might be more of a pulling sensation. Which, yeah, it, it makes the, the topic fun and also challenging to study because we know that muscle cramping during exercise most commonly happens in the first couple of weeks of practices. So I know football is really just ramping up here in the state of Texas. And so we tend to see a great deal of muscle cramping and heat exhaustion cases in the first couple of weeks of practice as players return to their sport. And the tricky bit is, are they cramping up because it's hot out? Are they cramping up because their body's not accustomed to the intensity and the duration of football uh, practices? Is it the you know intensity of returning to their sport that's adding to stress in their lives that's making their nervous systems be more predisposed to cramping? Again, it's, it's a complex problem to solve because there are so many things interacting with each other. So it's great that you mentioned that because I was just about to say, Hey, it's football season, right? Football season's here. And when we look at some athletes, right, some of the level of fitness of these athletes in the training, we assume, you know, these athletes are conditioned, they're ready to start the season. And then in the first game, it's like, wow, they're down with a cramp. Is this due to that intensity? Like from what I've heard in some places, game speed's going to be different than practice speed and that, you know, the intensity of that game speed and maybe some adrenaline and different things could be factoring in. But curious to get your professional uh, insight on that. All right. Yeah. So if, if you change your perspective to there are lots of different roads that get to the same destination, meaning there are lots of different pathways that can combine to elicit muscle cramping and you're not pigeonholing yourself into thinking it's just a singular cause like dehydration or fatigue, then I think it opens you up to explore lots of those different possibilities. Like you mentioned stress. So one of the things that's not studied quite nearly enough in, in terms of muscle cramping is the effect of psychology on our uh, central nervous system. And so we have some preliminary data that would suggest that people who get muscle cramps, say during a, a marathon or a triathlon, they start exercise with higher expectations on themselves and what they actually do when it comes to their performance in the event. And so if my thought process and my psychology is uh, in a higher level of stress, then perhaps my central nervous system is now becoming primed toward muscle cramping. But we know lots of athletes compete under highly stressful situations, but not all of them cramp. Uh, we also know that cramping affects professional athletes and some of our most conditioned uh, people in the world still get muscle cramping. So it can't just be fatigue, right? And we have lots of instances where people become dehydrated and yet they don't cramp, right? Because if dehydration by itself caused cramping, nobody would drink alcohol or caffeine or live in Texas or <laughs> go into a hot tub or speak for prolonged periods of time because those are all dehydrating activities. And yet if you separate those activities from physical work 
and even maybe physical work beyond a person's normal intensity or duration, you don't get muscle cramps. And so again, combining all of those things together, I think is what makes studying the path of physiology so tricky. Yeah, and that's, that's a really great point. And like you said, it's complex. It's, it's kind of hard just to say, this is the, this is the direct impact of that. And you mentioned the low, you, you just kind of shifted towards dehydration. So I want to talk a little bit about that on the electrolyte side, not just football season, but any season it's hot, right? It's hot in Texas. It's hot in here in Louisiana. We've, been, we've seen record temperatures and athletes are going to be sweating out a lot of electrolytes, but does losing particular electrolytes play any kind of role in causing muscle cramps at all? Right. So that's a great question. Again, I think the answer to that is sometimes. And um, what I think a lot of students struggle with when they start doing their own research is they, they're they uncomfortable with like shades of gray. Right. And so I tend to believe that dehydration can contribute to the onset of cramping, but I don't think it's the sole cause. For example, I know most athletes will show up to practices and competitions probably dehydrated. Right. And so we know they don't drink enough fluid. Uh, and we know that when we ask people to complete exercise sessions in a dehydrated state, they are not able to uh, do those exercise activities at as high intensity or for as long as if they started that exercise session hydrated. And so dehydration can induce premature fatigue. And so I don't believe that just being dehydrated causes cramping again, because then people want to go in hot tubs, drink alcohol, speak for prolonged periods of time, those kinds of things. But could it be like one of the ingredients in my recipe that causes me to cramp? Sure. I think that that's uh, certainly within the realm of reason. Is it the sole cause of cramping? Like a lot of the research in the early 1900s would suggest? No, I don't, I don't think so. And so I think when you look at dehydration and you look at the, the research that I've done and a lot of folks have done in the last 10 to 15 years, and you really try and separate the effects of dehydration from fatigue, what you find is that dehydration in and of itself doesn't contribute as much as I think we once thought it did to the etiology of cramping. And probably the, the best example for that is just how we treat cramps, right? If I have an athlete on a football field uh, develop a, a cramp in their calf, the first thing I do for them when I run out into the field is not throw them a bottle of sports drink, right? It's, I stretch their calf and static stretching, you know, gentle static stretching where you're elongating that muscle uh, normally breaks the cramp very quickly. And yet stretching doesn't add any fluids or electrolytes to the body. And so when we look for cause and effect relationships, when it comes to disease and medicine, uh, some injuries are really easy, right? I also study exertional heat stroke. So when someone has exertional heat stroke, their body core temperature is very high. And so therefore the treatment then is we got to cool them down. And so we put them in cold water immersion. Well, with muscle cramping, we have this weird uh, oxymoron statement where, okay, we we're going to say the cause is dehydration, but then the treatment's not hydration. It's <laughs> kind of paradoxical, right? So stretching shouldn't work if the cause of cramping was dehydration. And yet stretching almost always relieves acute muscle cramps during exercise. So we have lots of arguments and again, conflicting physiological arguments when it comes to the dehydration theory. So I don't think it's the sole cause. Do I think it has no effect at all? No, I don't believe that, but I don't think it's quite as prevalent as what we assumed like in the early 1900s and even up into like the 1990s. Now what's, what's really scary about the belief that dehydration causes cramping is what occurred in 2014, where we had two healthy high school American football players trying to prevent muscle cramping during exercise. And they believed that the cramps were because of dehydration. And so maybe you can, you know, empathize with their thought process. If you've been told your entire life that the reason why you cramp is because you're dehydrated and you go out on a football field and you practice for a while and you get a cramp in your calf. Well, you think, well, I got that cramp because I must be dehydrated. So you drink 
some fluid or you drink some sports drink, you get back on the football field, you run around some more and you get another cramp in the same muscle. And so your thought process goes back to, again, well, I must still be dehydrated. And so you drink even more fluid and more sports drinks. And that's what happened in 2014 to these two kids, Walker Wilbanks and Zyrese Oliver. They drank so much fluid that they gave themselves a, a different life-threatening condition called hyponatremia. And so having this profound belief that cramping is due to dehydration can have sometimes quite disastrous results. And so part of our job as athletic trainers and people in the sports medicine community is trying to help our athletes understand what safe levels of fluid ingestion looks like, what, what it means to have a proper diet and what it means for uh, eating enough electrolytes in the diet. Uh, we have to really help a lot of these kids understand that this is a more difficult problem than just drink special formula X or just drink this product or just take in this one thing and you'll be fine. Right. Yeah. And Dr. Miller mentioned hyponatremia. So if you're listening and going, well, what does that mean? That's just, you're drinking so much fluid, particularly water that's pushing blood sodium levels so low, as well as potentially blood potassium or hypokalemia to where when that electrolyte imbalance gets low, it can cause heart rhythm, malfunction, arrhythmias, cardiac arrest. And Dr. Miller, you can definitely explain a lot more than I can on that. But, um, because I'm sure a lot of people are going, all right, what's, what's hyponatremia? Yeah, hypo, just breaking down the term, hypo meaning low and natremia referring to sodium. So Tavis, you very, very uh, succinctly described what happens. And so when you drink uh, what we would call a hypotonic beverage, that's just a beverage that contains more water in it than it does like electrolytes. And every sports drink on the market is hypotonic when it comes to the electrolyte concentrations. Uh, your blood has more electrolytes in it than every popular sports drink on the market. And so uh, in the case of Zyrese Oliver, we believe that he drank upwards of four gallons of fluid. And so there's a very big misunderstanding that if you drink a sports drink, that because those sports drinks contain some electrolytes, that you're going to restore your electrolyte balance. And the math simply does not add up. Uh, the amount of sports drink you would have to consume to re fully replace the amount of sodium and the other electrolytes you lose in your sweat during a typical exercise session is very dangerous to do. And so that's why uh, when I give talks like this, I really stress the importance of really understanding how much fluid you lose during exercise. So we would call that like your sweat rate and also understanding what is in your sweat as far as an electrolyte concentration. And then once you have those two values, you can look at your diet to figure out how can I get sodium back into my diet safely based on how much I lose during exercise. Interesting. Yeah. And that's something that, you know, if you're listening to this and you have kids and you, you know, that's something that really pushes the fact that a lot of things kids are drinking today is not going to really truly uh, drinking too much of what they're drinking today is going to push a lot of the sodium and potassium lower in their blood. So we have to be careful not to overhydrate. Now, when we from look a at electrolyte perspective too, when it comes to like high school kids and diet, I almost never have to worry about sodium, right? <laughs> Most yeah. of the time, these these kids are eating Doritos, they're eating processed pizza at lunch, they've got salt everywhere in their diet. Usually, getting enough salt is not the problem, right? The USDA. Uh, ask that people eat two grams of, of sodium to have a healthy day of, you know, healthy diet. And so these kids are consuming so much sodium in their diet if they're eating the typical American diet that it's almost never a problem to replace their sodium. And so, again, not trying to give the impression that I'm anti-sports drink. I'm really not. Yeah, I agree. I, I think there's, there's a lot of op op options out there that are just way too low in the nutrients that they need, especially sodium, potassium, chloride, magnesium. But I know we're going to kind of kind of dive into that a little bit more. Now, when we look at blood work, right? So if we're looking at trying to indicate a potential cause of cramp, is there a way to maybe look at certain biomarkers or blood work to see if this could be a factor? There are. And this is kind of an evolving area. There hasn't been a, a lot of research on biomarkers or blood markers. What we What we do seem to know is that people that get cramping during events like marathons, 
their blood work oftentimes is no different than the people who do not get muscle cramping during the same event. So we've got lots of studies where we've compared red blood cell counts, uh, body masses, you know, sweat rates, ingested amounts of fluid. We've looked at their sodium, potassium, chloride, magnesium, calcium. And when you compare a lot of that literature between people who actually get cramping and don't, oftentimes those values are no different from each other. And so if you were just to hand me a blood sample and then say, is this a cramper or not? I'm gonna have a hard time distinguishing that truth. And so there's been some evolving science trying to link like creatine kinase with cramping and also maybe some uh, collagen genes with cramping. But to, to my knowledge at this point in time, we haven't really come up with a, a good blood test or any other biomarker to identify uh, cramp susceptibility. Now let's kind of shift to what I might say, I don't know the prevalence of this, but my wife struggles with night cramps and I'm sure other people have, like it could be middle of the night, her foot's just start killing or it could be her calf. And yep. is there a particular factor that you might think that could be contributing to this? Maybe is it too much activity during the day? Is it, is there anything else or something that could be a primary factor? Yeah, so great question and a question I get quite a bit. And this is where uh, we have to make assumptions in the cramping field. Um, again, when we talk about exercise-associated muscle cramps, it's quite the assumption to say that these are the same thing as nocturnal cramping. And so nocturnal cramping, I believe, is a neurological phenomenon, right? Because if you are asleep and you get awoken from sleep by a muscle uh, cramping, that has to be neurological, right? Because you're not exercising while you're asleep and sleep is uh, an activity that's controlled uh, subconsciously by our brain, right? So if you're being you know, awoken by a cramp in the middle of a dead sleep, it has to be due to some kind of overexcitation in your nervous system. And so we know that nocturnal cramping tends to affect uh, some folks who are typically advanced in years, uh, normally over the age of uh, 60, I would say, well, we start to see the prevalence of nocturnal cramping go up. And so we know that when we age, our nerves start to uh, deteriorate a little bit. And so could that cause nocturnal cramping or be a contributor? Uh, possibly. But I think, again, if you're being in a dead sleep and you get woken up by a calf cramp, it has to be neurological. So I'm just curious, she has some pretty bad dreams on a regular basis and stress. Could that be just that causing that stress, that thought process, maybe this random question? Yeah, I think so. And again, um, if we shift our perspective to a multifactorial uh, perspective, I think stress is just one of those things, like even with pain and prior injury, uh, those types of factors can shift the teeter-totter that might be our normal balance of how our nervous system behaves towards more of an excitation um, or over-excitation uh, path. And so if, uh, if she's experiencing intense dreams or uh, scary dreams or her stress levels are elevated, again, that could be one of those ingredients for her that inches her closer to her cramp threshold and then if she gets something else, like maybe her, her foot moves in a particular direction, then maybe that's that final ingredient that hits that threshold and now she cramps. Interesting. Awesome. Well, I can't wait to give her some feedback and say, here's what I think it is. Now, let's shift into, for those working in athletics, college, high school, even you know youth sports, travel ball, whatever that is, let's say an athlete has experiences a pretty bad cramp. Is there a protocol, remedy, where we can treat that? Is there something that obviously there's only so many things we can probably do, but what would be your recommendation or recommendations for an athletic trainer or somebody that's trying to treat a muscle cramp? Yeah, treatment is probably the best and uh, most understood area when it comes to um, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of all three of those areas. Again, most of the time, if you are experiencing an acute muscle cramp, gentle static stretching will almost always alleviate that cramp. And then once those cramps are alleviated, you can 
bring the athlete to the sidelines, and then you can work on some of the other factors that might be contributing to their cramp onset. Like maybe you do some massage, maybe you apply some ice packs and try and help with some of the pain and blocking those pain signals so you can interrupt that kind of pain, spasm pain cycle that might be occurring. Uh, but some of the more recent uh, data from my lab would suggest that cramping in and of itself so take away dehydration, take away electrolyte loss and sweat, take away all of that stuff. And you take a healthy person and you just ask them to cramp themselves. So I'm talking about a, a volitional cramp here where, again, we just ask people to like contract a muscle as hard as they can. When we measure their cramp susceptibility after they induced a cramp voluntarily, what we found was it was easier to cramp people all the way up to an hour after their volitional cramp, suggesting that just cramping in and of itself makes it easier to experience a second or a third cramp. And I think that describes kind of what we see in the athletic population too, right? Once they get a cramp in the second quarter, the athletic training staff is likely going to be fighting cramps in the third quarter and the fourth quarter and even after the game. And so, again, I think it's important to recognize that cramping is not a normal physiological issue, right? This is an abnormality in our body. And so we have to keep treating people even after we break that acute muscle cramp, because again, their central nervous system doesn't automatically just return back to normal once the cramp has gone away. And so that's where I think a lot of athletes and physically active people get frustrated is once they get that first cramp they know they're going to be fighting cramps for the rest of their activity. Interesting. Now you've talked about just the massage and some of the treatment protocols of trainers, anything diet related, any nutrition protocols that is going to help with that? Or is that just, you know, it's, that's not really something you've seen in the science to be beneficial. Yeah. Great question. Um, we do have some data to suggest that nutrition and diet might play a role. Uh, we have some data to suggest that like, sodium tablets or sodium ingestion before competitions really doesn't play a prophylactic role in preventing muscle cramping. Uh, that was done by Marty Hoffman's group uh, with the sodium ingestion. Uh, but there has been some more recent case studies suggesting that there could be some help with nutritional interventions. And again, if, if you if you identify a factor in your recipe for cramping that might be related to let's say, uh, blood glucose, then yeah, maybe if we alter your diet and we help broaden your diet and make sure it's more nutritious and, you know, has a, a vast array of energy sources in it, then I think it could be helpful for muscle cramping, but from a, a randomized control placebo driven trials with diet, those don't exist quite yet. Excellent. Now let's talk about some common myths. Uh, this was kind of fun for me to come up with some questions. Common myths of muscle crampings. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to state a few things and statements I've heard in my career, and I'm curious to get your feedback on what your thoughts are. So some of the things I've commonly heard, when you're cramping, have a banana to prevent cramping. So I just want to get your thoughts on that one. Sure. I was told, uh, eat bananas, and if you do, you won't get your cramps during soccer my entire life. And so one of the more fun studies that I did, I think it was back in uh, around 2014, we gave our subjects either zero, one, or two servings of bananas. And that equated to about one and a half to three bananas, if you break it down by how big of a, a banana is. So we sliced the bananas, we weighed them, we made people exercise in the heat, and then we fed them varying quantities of bananas. And our question was, you know, how fast can we get potassium to change in the bloodstream if you eat varying amounts of bananas, trying to link, again, cramping to potassium? And what we showed was it takes at least 30 to 60 minutes to see an actual change in potassium in your blood. And so if you've got a muscle cramp and you eat a banana, you have to understand that the changes that are going to occur in your blood are not going to be immediate. That banana has to be you know, broken down by your mouth, passed down through your stomach, into your small intestines, absorbed into your bloodstream, the blood's got to circulate to your cramping muscle and all of that takes time. So from a 
treatment perspective, bananas or really anything that you take into your mouth orally is really going to be slow because it has to go through that normal digestive process. And that process takes time. And so from a electrolyte perspective, bananas probably are not going to help people uh, alleviate cramping. But we also did show that you can change blood glucose quite dramatically with uh, one or two servings of bananas within a shorter time period. So we actually showed big increases in blood glucose after 15 minutes when you eat bananas. And so if you think of a, a typical American football halftime, you might actually have around 10 to 15 minutes. So you, if your athletes are cramping because they're experiencing maybe low blood glucose or one of the ingredients in their recipe might be fatigue, well, maybe bananas might help them from that perspective and increasing their, their blood sugar, but that study has not been done yet either. What about drinking pickle juice? Yeah, pickle juice is a fun phenomenon to talk about. I've, I've probably got more publications on pickle juice than anybody in the uh, medical literature. And this was a, a fun thing to study back when I was a doctoral student at BYU. We did a lot of studies with pickle juice ingestion when people were hydrated. We did it when they were dehydrated. We measured how fast pickle juice leaves the stomach to give us an idea of how fast it can be absorbed into the bloodstream. Uh, we've just done a ton of studies on pickle juice. And what we observed was our football players at BYU were filling up water bottles, one with pickle juice and then another water bottle with just water in it. And they would just go back and forth and take shots from each water bottle. And then we you know, eventually I think they changed their practice to everybody was just taking like a shot or a shot and a half with pickle juice before the game. And so the research would suggest again, that anything that you take in orally is going to take some time to be absorbed by your body. And so we know that most athletic trainers are giving athletes small volumes of pickle juice to drink. And so when I say small volumes, it's usually about a shot like a shot glass or maybe two shot glasses full of pickle juice. So less than like 150 milliliters of fluid. So it's not a lot. And so uh, we were told by, you know, several people that if you, if you drink pickle juice, you're going to dehydrate your athletes even more, or you're going to make them puke. And that simply is not the case in any of the research that we showed. Uh, that volume is so small that when mixed in with all of the other fluid in your body, uh, barely even moves the needle when it comes to your blood sodium, your blood potassium, calcium, magnesium, chloride. Uh, that amount of stimulus just is not enough to change your blood electrolytes. So from an electrolyte perspective, pickle juice probably is not doing anything. But we did show in a different study that when you drink pickle juice during an active cramp, and so I induced a muscle cramp with my electrical stimulation model that I use in my research. And then we had people drink either, again, about a shot and a half of pickle juice or a shot and a half of pure water. And then we measured how long the cramps lasted. And what we observed was pickle juice actually did shorten how long people cramped. And it was about a 30 to 40% reduction compared mm -hmm. to either no fluid or the water trial. And we tried to do a placebo trial as best we could, but the only thing you have a hard time doing is masking flavor. So even though we put nose plugs on everybody and we tried to blind everything as best we could, you could still taste the difference between the two solutions. But even with pickle juice, we noticed that the average length of the cramp was still around 90 seconds. And so when you compare all the different treatments that we can give somebody to stop a active cramp, Again, static stretching that's gentle will normally leave a cramp within maybe 10 seconds. And so that amount of time, 90 seconds to relieve a cramp is still considerably faster than what is possible for that fluid to leave the stomach, be absorbed by your small intestines, work its way through your circulation to the crampy muscle, and then relieve the cramp. And so the study I mentioned to you that we measured how fast pickle juice leaves the stomach, we showed that it takes at least about 20 minutes for pickle juice to start leaving the stomach. And so mm. we have this interesting phenomenon where the cramps seem to go away quite quickly, but the fluid's not even out of the stomach yet, and it hasn't even changed any of the major blood electrolytes. And so what we proposed, 
uh, back in 2010 was that the pickle juice, and most likely it's the vinegar or the acetic acid, it causes some kind of uh, change in the nervous system that interrupts that muscle cramp. And that might be the, the way that pickle juice helps people and helps prevent muscle cramping. Interesting. Now, that's pretty fascinating. I've heard that for so long, and it's good to know really the true physiology around that. Now, last one on this topic, creatine causes dehydration and muscle cramp. Yeah, this was a, a very popular myth, especially in the 1990s, early 2000s, where for a long time, creatine was kind of given a, a very bad reputation for you know causing dehydration and muscle cramping. And I, I think the thought process was because creatine tends to attract water molecules to it, that if we increase creatine in the muscles, then we're drawing more fluid into the muscles. And if you draw fluid from your blood vessel into the muscles, then the, you know, the blood becomes more concentrated. It might even give you metrics that make you look like you're dehydrated. And so I think that was the fear behind, you know, not taking creatine. And so people then kind of linked it with more dehydration, but to my knowledge, there is no evidence to suggest that creatine increases the risk of muscle cramping. In fact, there's, I would say more published evidence to suggest the opposite, that creatine might actually help prevent muscle cramping. Now, I, I think you have to take a look at some of those studies with a grain of salt, because oftentimes the, uh, the authors might supplement with creatine, like maybe five grams a day or something like that, but they oftentimes don't control for diet. And so that's where it gets a little bit sticky of, you know, is it the supplementation that's been helping people or is it their diet with the supplementation? So I think there are some methodological issues that we need to think of when we, when we talk about the creatine and cramping literature, but from a perspective of does it cause more dehydration or does it cause more cramping? I think that also is a myth. My right, last question, Doc, is let's talk about any, is there any, or are there any additional common myths of muscle, muscle cramps that you've heard over your career that you'd like our listeners to know about, or just anything you'd like to close with? Yeah, I think, again, this is such a, a fun topic to talk about because everybody's got a mom or a grandma that says, you know, do this and you won't get muscle cramping. I mean, I've heard uh, questions about antacids. I've heard people say, if you put an ivory bar of soap underneath your sheets, you don't get cramping. Uh, you know, quinine is another uh, solution that people take to stop cramping. You know, I've, I've gotten lots of things. Again, we already talked about bananas, but mustard is another very popular question that people will ask me about. And so if we, we very briefly touch on those, Again, mustard, I think is probably the easiest one to explain because again, mustard has vinegar in it. So if pickle juice works via the vinegar idea, then mustard might help in that way. Uh, funny enough, I did a study where we gave people the equivalent of half a cup to three quarters of a cup of mustard. So if you can imagine like your normal French's yellow mustard bottle, we gave each subject about half of that bottle of mustard within about a minute and a half or two minutes. And then we measured their blood electrolytes and blood electrolytes don't change when you take in a ridiculous amount of mustard. That was, it was the equivalent of 30 mustard packets. And most athletic trainers, if they give mustard are usually having their people eat maybe one packet, maybe two packet of mustard, certainly not 30. Uh, but we gave 30 just to see what would happen to the electrolytes in the bloodstream and nothing happened. And so again, uh, mustard probably not going to help from an electrolyte standpoint, but could it help from the vinegar standpoint? Possibly. Uh, quinine is a, another thing that has been shown to be effective in quinine sulfate or tonic water, which it has the main ingredient of quinine, is quite effective for preventing and treating muscle cramps. But the problem is uh, the FDA, at least in the United States, banned quinine because it also causes heart issues. And so I never recommend that anybody take in quinine, quinine sulfate, tonic water, or any of those things, because you certainly don't want to give yourself any cardiac arrhythmias or those types of things. Excellent. Doc, this was a phenomenal podcast, but we're not done. I have a few things that I want to ask because we're going to move to our curveball round. This has nothing to do with today's topic. Today's topic was fantastic. I've learned a lot of new things that I was not fully aware of, but I want to kind of have some fun with this. So you ready? 
I'm ready. All right. So my first question is always a, a staple. I'm a music junkie, and I'm always curious to see what other people like to do when it comes to music. So if you could be the lead singer of any band, whether it's past or present, who would that be? Uh, the the first one off the top of my head would be like ACDC. Um, I just I love all of the classic rock. So Bon Jovi, ACDC, Journey, pretty much every song I think people pull if they go to a karaoke bar. <laughs> that, that gets everybody just really excited and having fun. Any of those bands are phenomenal. Nice. If you could go back and talk to your young self, what would you tell yourself based on what you know today? Keep going. Um, I have a ton of fun with what I do. I, I, I cannot imagine doing anything different. And so what I always advise my students to do is, you know, pick a career or pick an area of research. If you're going to go into research that you absolutely love to read about, that you can't get enough um, in your day-to-day -day life so if you do what you love, you'll never work, I think is what the old euphemism is. And I'm certainly in a place where I get to have a lot of fun doing research. I get to involve students in that research a lot of times. I get to contribute back to my profession in ways I never thought possible. And so talks like this have been something that has been quite frequent in my career as well. And so it's just a, a great opportunity to help people and also give back to science and have some fun while you're doing it. Last one, if you could have one superpower, what would that be? Ooh, man. Well, I am a Superman aficionado, so he is my, my favorite superhero, but he's kind of like a, a grab bag of every superpower. So I guess for me, it would probably be uh, flight. I think that's nice. a lot of fun and could certainly save me on some, some flight bills. <laughs> That's definitely true. Well, Doc, it's good to have you. Thank you for this wonderful podcast today talking about cramping. I'm sure this is going to be a really informative and uh, it was beneficial for a lot of our listeners. So I hope you have a great time. We'll have you back on a future podcast at some point. But thank you so much for the time today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks so much. Well, that's it for today's show. Thanks for listening to the All Me podcast from the Taylor Hooten Foundation, a nonprofit organization leading a national campaign to enlighten people to the truths about appearance and performance enhancing substances and inspiring people to live and compete without the use of these substances. Please be sure to subscribe to our podcast and tune in to our next episode.